um, I titled this Falling to the Cracks because that's actually something I say quite commonly um, to my patients, whether they have Lyme or they just aren't able to get help from their doctors because they've fallen through a, a crack in our healthcare system. Um, so I'm sure that most of you can actually relate to that. Um, so just a little bit about me. I'm a doctor of Chinese medicine. I've been practicing um, acupuncture and uh, Chinese herbs for eight years. I got into Chinese medicine because of my own health, but I didn't know what was wrong yet. It was just the only thing that had helped me. Um, so Chinese medicine basically is... Um, it's 5,000 years old. It's an entire health system. Um, and in my practice, I actually incorporate Chinese herbs, supplements, acupuncture, acutonics, which is tuning forks, diet, lifestyle. And I also do biomeridian testing. Uh, so the biomeridian testing is electrodermal testing. So it's the same technology as an ECG. It measures um, points on your hands and feet, and it's measuring your body's response to certain things. So um, this is how I test for Lyme disease. It's not a blood test. It's considered a clinical diagnosis, but it still is a able to get people to have some answers. Um, and I also do allergy testing and um, other things that people need along with that. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about my journey with Lyme disease. And uh, see already. <laughs> they started it. <laughs> um, I was bitten um, in 1995 when I was 16. I was also bitten when I was four, um, but my symptoms didn't really start until I was 16, so we do um, suspect that that is when I contracted Lyme. Um, my symptoms started then, but they were quite minor. Um, I had eczema, tendonitis, um, depression, and I developed insomnia a little bit later on, and those were all considered separate things, so uh, we didn't even think of them as being, um, you know, one big lump sum. I didn't get a target rash. I didn't get... Uh, you know, the flu-like symptoms, and I didn't get joint pain until about eight years later. So, um, you know, it would have never even, you know, we would never have thought about it. Um, in 2001, I became severely ill. I had severe uh, fatigue and digestive problems. So at that point, that's when I started to look for a solution to what was going on, and um, I did not find one. I went to 23 doctors, specialists, you name it, everything, and um, I was diagnosed with candida about five times, and that's about as far as I got, um, and it didn't help. So um, basically, I kind of went on, and I continually got worse. The Chinese medicine helped me to be able to function, and uh, but I would still have crashes. I was just able to bring myself out of those. In uh, about 2008, I became severely ill, and I couldn't bring myself out of what I was experiencing. I spent over $20,000 with an integrative doctor, and all that got me was my diagnosis of Lyme disease. That was not treatment. So um, this is why I do what I do with biomeridian testing, because I don't think people should have to spend $20,000 in a country where healthcare system is considered free just to get a diagnosis of what's going on. And that doesn't count the expensive long-term treatment that you have to do. So at my time of diagnosis, I'm sure most of you know Lyme disease does not come on its own. You never just have the Lyme infection. So I had Lyme, uh, two co-infections, Babesia and Bartonella. I had a parasite, Candida, positive rheumatoid factor, but that was nothing. Um, they just sent me home. Celiac disease, mercury toxicity. I was deficient in every vitamin, mineral, and amino acid. <coughs> and I had multiple food allergies and chemical sensitivities. I was actually allergic to everything, um, quite severely, anaphylactic to some. Um, in the mo first month that I was diagnosed, I realized that Lyme was an epidemic and we just couldn't see it. Um, my cat was diagnosed two weeks before I got my test results back because I made them test him after he had a tick on him and started limping. My sister and my mom also have Lyme disease. We suspect that my brother, um, well, I suspect that my stepbrother died of complications of this disease because he was undiagnosed and untreated. Um, I have a friend who had, uh, also had Lyme disease and two of her co-workers as well are infected and two friends who had friends another friend and I realized I was already treating at least six people with a disease so you know that's just within a month of the diagnosis and that's just to show you that if you ask around you're actually not alone and you will find that you you either know somebody else who's affected by this or you know somebody who knows somebody else who's affected um, I think we could close the window it's a little loud I think So just a little bit about Lyme disease. I'm sure everybody knows, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Okay. 
I can go? Okay. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about um, the history of Lyme, because I think most people know that this is pretty basic stuff. Um, it was diagnosed in, uh, it was discovered in 1981 by Willie Bergdorfer um, in Lyme, Connecticut, and uh, mainly because there was a lot of people, a lot of children with rheumatoid um, arthritis, uh, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and there are several theories to why there was this recent outbreak, because it's actually an old disease. We're not going to talk about the theories, but that is something to look into if you're into that, or you want to get a little more paranoid than you already are. <laughs> Um, but uh, basically, um, Itzy the Iceman, I don't know if anybody knows about him, he was discovered in the Alps about 20 years ago, and he had Lyme disease. He is about 5,000 years old. So um, the Lyme bacteria has been around for a long time, but there is a reason why it's such an epidemic now, and it is being ignored as well. Oh, sorry. I thought about this. <laughs> Someone else made this. <laughs> so um, basically, Lyme is a uh, spirochete. Um, so it's a spirochete bacteria. So it will kind of drill into things if you want to think of it that way. Um, these are kind of what it would look like. Um, and is what it looks like. It's uh, it's um, mice, um, birds, deer um, do have it, and it is also con um, passed on by ticks, fleas, other um, bugs that will bite those animals and then pass it on to humans. And now there's also human-to-human -human contact, which we've heard two stories about that. And uh, nobody knows because there is no studies being done, but it's also believed that it's actually transmitted because it is related to syphilis, which is also a spirochete bacteria. It's also faster than syphilis. So, um, you know, to say that it's not is just a little bit irresponsible. Um, so less than 50% of those remember actually being bitten by a tick and this is why. Um, this is how small they can be. Um, so they will crawl on you, they will bite you, they'll numb you when they bite you, and they'll crawl up and you will have no idea. And if you're among those that don't get a target rash, you're hooped and you'll spend 20 years looking. And so this is also what they they can look like. I think Michelle's. <laughs> do you? Good job. <laughs> it's a good good example. Um, and so just to point out one thing that people often hear if they go to their doctor was you weren't in an endemic area, so you couldn't and you weren't bitten by a tick, so you couldn't have gotten Lyme. Lyme does not have borders, so there is no border patrol between BC and Alberta getting all the tear, the, the ticks off the deer and the birds as they cross the border. Like, that just doesn't happen. We are so close to BC. It is across Canada. It's actually a reportable disease across Canada. It's just that doctors don't know this. We know this. So, um, you know, and the fact that my cat, who lives five minutes from here, has Lyme disease and he's never left, you know, the yard um, is also something to consider. You haven't bitten your cat. <laughs> Nobody should. <laughs> um, so we all know the classic symptoms of Lyme disease. So there's the target rash um, or the bullseye rash, um, which can not even necessarily look like a bullseye. And you can get flu-like symptoms and joint pain, which Michelle had, um, but Sarah and I did not. And I'm not sure that's even a good example. And it's not one out of three either. Um, it's uh, it's probably about uh, I want to um, less than fifty percent um, report having a target rash, and the problem is that we have so few cases that are actually reported. Like Sarah said, one out of ten um, that actually know they have Lyme, which means the incidences of the target rash is probably not fifty percent. I've seen it listed as ten, thirty, fifty, and eighty percent will get target rash. So which one is it? We have no idea. Um, I've also read that um, there was a study done with mice on um, Lyme disease, and they found that the mice didn't get the target rash until they were reinfected with Lyme. So that could be why it's so rare to get the target rash is that you already have Lyme and then you're reinfected and then you get the reaction. So when you get Lyme disease, when you get bitten, um, you there's three stages to Lyme. The first stage is early infection. So that's about um, two days to three, really. You shouldn't wait longer than that. <laughs> um, so if you get treatment in that time, so if Michelle had gotten, you know, say about six weeks of treatment, then she probably wouldn't have Lyme disease right now. Um, but unfortunately, that doesn't happen. Um, what? And then the second stage is just the infection starts spreading, and then this is just a longer time period to have the infection. Chronic Lyme disease is um, when it becomes neurological, systemic, and very, very difficult to treat. 
And uh, so this is probably where I'm going to start crying because just like um, Sarah felt, I, you know, I could have gone online and I could have just found you a bunch of symptoms that Lyme disease can have. And I don't think that that's a fair representation. So I'm going to attempt to read you my symptom list um, of what I experienced at the height of my illness. And unfortunately, there's about 120 symptoms here. So bear with me. It takes about three to four minutes if I can make it through it. So I had fibromyalgia, swollen glands, sore throat, sinus congestion, chills and fever, uh, sore uh, soles on my feet, plantar fasciitis, tendonitis, Morton's neuroma, joint pain and swelling, carpal tunnel syndrome, TMJ, neck creaks and cracks, neck stiffness, neck pain. See? <laughs> That's only two lines. <laughs> Um, so yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're not all in here. I thought of some after we made it. So unexplained back pain, muscle pain and cramping, obvious muscle weakness, twitching of all muscles, shin splints. I had seizure like symptoms, so I had no control of my body or muscles, um, burning swollen lips, swollen tongue, edema, confusion, difficulty thinking, difficulty with concentration. So reading, um, problem absorbing new information, word search, name block, and I also couldn't type forgetfulness, poor short-term memory, poor attention, disorientation, so getting lost, going to wrong places, which I still do, by the way, um, speech errors, wrong words, um, and misspeaking, messy syndrome, which is the ability to function at work but not at home, mood swings, irritability, depression, anxiety, social anxiety, so this is a miracle I'm here, panic attacks, tremors, headaches, head congestion, light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, sensitivity to heat, Problems with my vision it was uh, double vision, blurry and floaters, dry eyes, ear pain, problems with my hearing, so buzzing, ringing, and I've lost some hearing, increased motion sickness, vertigo, spinning, off balance, tippy feeling, lightheadedness, unavoidable need to sit or lie down, tingling, numbness, aching, burning or stabbing sensations, shooting pains, skin hypersensitivity, acne, psoriasis, eczema, rashes, dental pain, periodontal disease, poor recovery from surgery and injury, fatigue, poor stamina, extreme fatigue with too much activity, but vertigo and heaviness with too little activity, insomnia and fraction sleep, napping during the day, unexplained weight gain, so I gained 20 pounds in one month, unexplained hair loss, pain in the genital area, unexplained menstrual irregularity, breast pain, fibrocystic breasts, loss of libido, PMS, irritable bladder, oily urine, nausea, vomiting, dry retching, heartburn, stomach pain, bloating, constipation, diarrhea, abdominal pain and cramps, lack of appetite, skin tags, stretch marks, red papules, heart palpitations, skip beats, chest wall pain, sore ribs, breathlessness, air hunger, unexplained chronic cough, burning breath, night sweats, day sweats, exaggerated symptoms with alcohol, addictions, multiple food allergies, multiple chemical sensitivities, my symptoms flared at the full moon and I was told I was healthy just so you know and so that's just an example of what this can look like um, I'm also going to share with you a video that no one outside a few family members has seen I was actually taken to uh, ER with seizure like symptoms there wasn't a seizure and they couldn't explain it and uh, um, I basically had no control of my body or I couldn't speak um, I couldn't walk and this is the next day so this is um, you know, after they sent me home and said that I was fine. And this is not even half of what I was experiencing at that time. Um, I continued to have twitches like this for probably six months or so. And I had uh, facial tics for a year after. I now don't have any of it. And if I didn't know what I was treating and dealing with, I would have been heavily medicated and that would have just been it for me. So just to point out a few other things that kind of don't always get talked about, um, the non-physical symptoms of Lyme disease. So these are things that you basically will experience because you're chronically ill. Number one is that you have seen three to 30 or more doctors and nobody has been able to help you and your blood work all looks absolutely normal, except maybe your thyroid. Um, there's also financial challenges because like I said, I spent $20,000 just to get diagnosed. And, um, you know, my husband and I don't have retirement savings because the treatment was then expensive. So um, it's not an easy journey. Um, it's all in your head. Who here's heard that one? <laughs> yeah. So I think we can all uh, relate to that. Basically, that's uh, 
trying to go to your doctor, getting help, and they just don't believe you because they can't explain it. They don't understand it. So that's just it. There's also outside pressures to stop treatment because either you have friends or family or your doctor who don't understand the disease. They're wondering why after two months of treatment, you're not better. They're, um, they just don't, you know, they believe the propaganda that Lyme disease doesn't exist. And, um, a lot of people actually stop treatment because of this. Because uh, it's too hard to continue when you have somebody at home who's probably just as sick as you, angry at you because you're spending money and trying to get better. Um, and then lack of support kind of falls under that. Some people are doing this by themselves, which is really great that we're here, actually, because, um, you know, even if you have a partner, sometimes you can feel alone in that. And it's nice to find other people that understand this. And the social isolation is is even different than that because it's not necessarily that you ha you you can have as much support in the world, but then you can come to a day where you're supposed to see a friend or do something, and all of a sudden within an hour your health is turned and you have to cancel, and that's just it. There's nothing you can do. So and not everybody will understand that even if they try to understand the disease that it's really nothing you can do about that. And a lot of people do get divorced or friendships and either because of your own anger or because of their lack of understanding. And uh, there is a lot of denial or lack of acceptance of the disease by patients as well who don't see how sick they are or believe the propaganda. And um, I'm not going to read this out, but this is uh, just a list of some of the diseases that um, can be wrongly diagnosed when it's actually Lyme or can come along with Lyme. Um, the top ones would be like MS, Parkinson's, ALS, um, and Alzheimer's, and then fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue are symptoms of Lyme. They are never something that come on their own. So if you have chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, you need to find out what that is. It's not necessarily Lyme, but there's something causing that disharmony in your body. So this is from the Health Canada's website. And uh, uh, we all know, because nobody here has been diagnosed by their Canadian doctor, that um, there is a problem with diagnosing Lyme disease in Canada. And actually, there's some problems in the States as well. They just have better tests, and you can get them if you want them. Um, so what they say is that it's about the doctor's assessment of the patient, the history that you've been bitten by ticks, but we know that that shouldn't actually be on there because you don't necessarily see the ticks, um, and the results of laboratory testing. But they have this line at the bottom that says all laboratory tests have a margin of error, which is li why Lyme disease should be diagnosed clinically and first and foremost. And uh, laboratory testing is only supportive evidence. So a clinical diagnosis means that you either don't have a lab test because you can't afford to send it to the states or you have a negative one and you and your doctor or health practitioner believe that you should go ahead with treatment because you fit that that space and um, so they're saying this on their website but you will never get this from a doctor um, so in Canada, Lyme testing, just so people understand, because a lot of people don't understand why they can't get tests and why their doctor don't want to, and I think it's important to talk about how this is done in Canada and actually North America. Um, it's a two-tiered testing that we have set up. So first you get the ELISA test done, and then you get the Western blot if the ELISA is positive, and that's to rule things out. And I'll explain why there's problems with that. So the ELISA test is considered a screening test. And so what happens with a screening test is it's supposed to be something that's a little overly sensitive and you'll get a lot of false positives and you won't get false negatives, but only false positives. And you'll move on to the second test to rule out those false positives and get your actual diagnosis. The problem is that our ELISA test actually gives 35% false negatives. So a lot of people don't even move on to the next step, and then they think there's there's nothing wrong with them, and they have to continue to move on. So right then and there, and this is why doctors don't even want to test you, because the ELISA is always giving these negatives. Um, the Western blot, that's the next test that you would get, um, and what that is, um, is it's, it's an antibody test. So it's looking for the antibodies that you're producing against the Lyme spirochete. Um, the problem, there's many problems with the one in Canada. Um, one, they're only looking for one um, kind of Lyme, and I think there's 12, or there might be more, just 14 now. Um, so, you know, if you have that one, you're lucky. Also, if you have that one and it's fairly early on and your immune system is working, then you're lucky and you'll get a positive test. Unfortunately, what happens when you have long-term Lyme disease is it starts attacking your immune system. You no longer make antibodies and they don't find them and then they say you're done. You don't have Lyme. Off you go because they don't understand the test. So um, what's best to do um, is to send 
your uh, blood work to actually to the states. The lab is Igenix, and you would ask for the Western blot. Don't bother with the ELISA. And uh, if it come back, comes back negative in the beginning of your treatment and you believe you have Lyme, you do treatment for about three months or so, and then you get the Western blot done again and you will have a higher chance of having a positive. It costs, I think, does anybody know, five, eight hundred dollars or something to do that? It's five hundred. Yeah. Depends on where you get it done. <laughs> Mine was eight hundred. Um, so, and just to be, I touched a little bit on co-infections and that, but I just want to point out that Lyme does not come on its own again. So the red ones on the side there are some of the co-infections that you can have. So the tick or the flea that bites you doesn't have one infection. It will have many, and it will give them to you as soon as it bites you. And there's none of this. The tick has to be on you for 24 hours because I don't tick on me for only an hour. Um, they will tell you that. They told my sister that when she had a huge rash on her back, her entire back. It was an allergy. <laughs> That's what they said anyway. So the other things on the side here are some of what can be complications of Lyme disease. Um, viruses are a huge issue because you have no immune system. Uh, parasites, heavy metals come along with us quite often because you can't deal with them or just because you have them. Um, KPU is a, a condition that can come with Lyme. Uh, you can also have mold toxicity, which will then exacerbate the Lyme and they'll work together to make it worse um, or often trigger the symptoms and people will just think it's mold because that triggered the immune response. Um, EMF exposure, so it's uh, electromagnetic uh, frequencies um, people are often quite sensitive to. And then, of course, allergies go without saying because that just comes when you have that much going on. So the Lyme treatment, which is another place we have a big flaw, this is also from Health Canada's website. This is why your doctor won't help you and doesn't believe you. So um, they say that Lyme disease can be cured with two to four weeks of the listed antibiotics here. Um, what? Uh, obviously that doesn't work. We have Michelle did that. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it doesn't get there, um, especially if you leave it. You get it on the first day, you have a chance to actually get it in four weeks. Um, but you can see here, even on the website, it says patients diagnosed in later stages of disease can have persistent or recurrent symptoms requiring a longer course of antibiotic treatment, but they don't specify how long that is. And what happens here is doctors who treat you longer than four weeks with antibiotics are actually in danger of losing their license. So, you know, if this isn't their fight, I actually don't blame them for not wanting to do that. Um, so we have to get this changed so that we have other options if antibiotics is where you want to be. In the Lyme community, they actually say that the uh, treatment for Lyme disease should be minimum 18 months. It's often longer. Two is a good place. Two years is a good place to be. This is a Lyme life cycle. Um, Health Canada does not really recognize chronic Lyme except for that one line that they have, but on their website actually says chronic Lyme does not exist. So if you get an infection that takes four weeks to treat with antibiotics and you don't treat it right away, it will just go away on its own. That's kind of what I get from that theory. So if we don't treat the infection, it is going to become serious, and I, the logic is lacking there, in my opinion. Um, and if you, I'm sure most people have experienced this, if you're trying to get help from your doctor for <laughs> Lyme, you will face persecution, and most people aren't treated very well, and if you are, you're lucky. Um, this is, Dr. Jushu Klinghart is, uh, he's a German doctor practicing in the States. He's a leading Lyme doctor in the world. And he says antibiotics as a solution is naive. Um, they can be part of the treatment, but they are not all of it. They are actually a very minuscule part of the treatment if that's what you choose to do. And I'll explain why. Um, the Lyme is smarter than we are. Um, I made this comment to the doctor that diagnosed me because we're fighting about whether it exists and it's killing us. So um, there's kind of something wrong with that balance, I think. Um, so what happens is the Lyme actually will change its form. So it has an L form, it creates cysts, it hides in a biofilm, it changes its surface protein, it actually attacks the white blood cells, and it will tell, so the white blood cells are your immune system. They're the soldiers that come out and fight infection. So what you have now is you basically have spies, you know, inside your white blood cells. And they're telling the white blood cells, we like that infection, we're just going to leave it alone, and you're no longer engaging in this disease, in this infection, um, and your body isn't fighting anymore. And then you get sicker and sicker. Um, it also creates a biotoxin when it dies. So treating this is just as hard as having it, often harder, because when when it dies, it's a biotoxin. A biotoxin is like, this is biowarfare. 
right? This is, this is patented, actually, the biotoxin killed, that Lyme creates. So what we have when we treat Lyme is called a Herxheimer reaction. So that's a reaction, like, we all know that when you detox, you feel worse before you get better. Um, you know, if you do a normal detox from the health food store, you got maybe a week where you feel bad. <laughs> you take that and you, like, by times by 100, and that's what a Lyme person goes through for two years. And um, it's not an easy journey for anybody. And uh, um, it's, uh, you know, sorry, I got a little distracted, but it, it's definitely not easy. And that thought can actually throw some people off and they won't want to um, start treatment because it's not easy. They don't have the support. They have to work that, you know, whatever is there. But, um, you know, it, um, herxing, as it's called, is not the easiest thing in the world. So what the biofilm is, um, is it, it's like a mucus film. Um, I always describe it as like an armor that the lime is hiding in. Or if you think of a castle with a big wall around it, and then the lime hides inside of that, especially as soon as you start anything antimicrobial. So that would be herbs or antibiotics. And then what we have to do, if we, if you don't do work on this, you basically are not even treating the lime. You are putting it in remission and hiding, and it's going to stay in your body. Uh, what we have to do is we've got to shoot cannons at that wall. We're going to get the bad guys out. Um, and at the moment, I mean, we've only known about the biofilm for about four or five years with lime. So there's, um, there's a handful of things we can use to treat it. Um, that's getting more and more every year, um, but uh, it does add that complication, and this is why we have so much trouble getting rid of Lyme, one of the reasons. So when I treat Lyme disease, my first step is first to determine whether somebody does have Lyme because there are other um, things that can look like this because so many symptoms can be Lyme. Um, so that's my first thing. And then if there is Lyme, number one is changing your diet and your lifestyle because, you know, most people aren't eating very well. Um, gluten is a huge issue for everybody with Lyme. I mean, 80% of the population has the genes to be gluten uh, sensitive and people with Lyme generally get that gene transcribed and then gluten is just not your friend anymore. So we got to get that out. If we don't, you're going to have rampant inflammation that we're chasing around and then we won't understand what we're doing and I can supplement you to death and we just won't get there. Um, also no sugar because that will feed the infections and uh, um, generally no dairy and then make sure there's a balanced diet. All of these things are um, highly addictive. So this can be a huge challenge for people in the beginning just to do that, um, let alone all the other information that we give them. And then the next step is to assess for other things going on. So whether there's chemical sensitivity, sensitivity to EMF, so the electromagnetic field, um, you know, like the TV would be giving off one, that kind of thing. And some people just can't even sit in front of a computer because they'll be affected by that. Mold exposure and then changing other habits. If somebody's able to exercise, I encourage them to do so. Um, and this is different for everybody. Um, when I was at my sickest, you know, walking across the house was a big deal. Um, it, but for some people, they're able to still do yoga and run and do all those kind of things. And so it's kind of finding that balance for you. If you get tired after you exercise, you did too much. Um, and one of the biggest things is whether somebody can still work. Um, I encourage people to try to still work if they can, and we work at their protocol with that. Some people aren't able to, um, but that's a personal journey. I find if people are able to still um, do something, they actually get better faster because they um, don't sit around thinking about how horrible they feel. Um, they're distracted a little bit, although at the same time, some people aren't able to work. So there's that balance. Um, we have to take care of emotions and spirits, so whatever that is for somebody, a psychologist or whatever they need, because that is always affected. And energy work would be like Tai Chi, Qi Gong, meditation. Um, and developing a team of practitioners, because I certainly don't know everything, and nobody does. So um, we need to get, you know, chiropractors, physiotherapists, a doctor, anything that the person needs on their team. Um, and self-therapies would be like um, lymphatic massage, dry brushing, um, Epsom salt baths. So that's kind of where I start. That's a lot. <laughs> um, and then the next step is to actually prepare the body for what is next. Um, so that would be supporting detox pathways. So we have to look at things like liver, kidney, lymphatics. Are they moving properly? Usually they need some support. Um, and clearing up gut infections. So um, candida or parasites. Uh, candida is like yeast. And any other toxicity that they need. Um, and then also starting chelators for the biofilm. So when we're 
creating, when we're killing something, is creating, sorry, not biofilm, biotoxin. When we're creating this biotoxin, we can't just let it float around the body that's not working properly. You need something to bind to it and drag it out safely. Um, so there are several things that we can do for that um, according to what the patient needs. Um, I often start people taking green clay for a month um, and then uh, we go on some other things as well. And then the biofilm treatment starts before the Lyme treatment because as soon as you start antimicrobial things, the Lyme creates biofilm and we want less biofilm because it makes it harder to treat. We also need to support the immune system and we need to avoid supplements that actually feed the infection. So that's magnesium, calcium, iron, and hormone supplementation. Um, there are ways around this. So we use topical magnesium or Epsom salt baths. Um, I have a supplement that um, will steal the iron from the, the bugs and give it back to the person because the iron's used in biofilm. So that's part of the, the biofilm therapy. And of course, always starting slow. Some people think that you need to start Lyme disease at full force and just kill it. And with that biotoxin, you can actually kill somebody. So it's actually starting at a very slow pace to what the person can tolerate and going uh, quickly is um, irresponsible, in my opinion. So like I said, the biofilm is crucial to the treatment. If you have a doctor practitioner treating you and they're not talking about biofilm, you need to um, either get somebody else on your get somebody else on your team, whether working with them or finding somebody else, because you will not get rid of this infection. Um, the uh, so as soon as you start treatment, the line creates a biofilm, which is why we do the biofilm treatment first. So with my protocol, um, I use herbs that have actually been proven to be stronger than antibiotics. Um, what antibiotics like doxycycline do is they actually just um, like morph the bacteria and change the shape and make it harder to treat and then put it in biofilm. Um, some of it will die off, but then it protects itself and hides from it. So the, the herbs that I use will actually treat all the forms of Lyme and kill them off, which is why my treatment can be stronger as well. Um, and then um, I can't stress the biofilm stuff enough. <laughs> Um, and just to point out that a treatment should always be individualized. There's no like set, this is how I treat Lyme and this works for everybody because we are all different people. So it needs to be different for everybody. I need to go slow. <coughs> so at a certain um, point in my treatment, um, usually depending on the person, about three months into them being on the cemento and which are the Lyme treatments, I do a technique called pulsing. So it was Dr. Lee Cowden that proved that within 36 hours of stopping any antimicrobial treatment, the Lyme will then come out of the biofilm. And so what we do is we stop the treatment and we actually start taking herbs that it won't recognize at full dose. So this is a little bit hard on most people, a little bit. <laughs> and uh, um, But, you know, it's it's something that we have to do to treat this bug that's actually, you know, smarter than we are. Um, and generally we, we go through the protocol and uh, uh, we do this for 15 months or more, this part, the pulsing part, and it gets easier as you go. And the herbs that I use um, do treat um, some of the co-infections, um, but that doesn't mean that they will completely eradicate them. So I monitor the patient once we're here and then if there's a certain point where um, we need to treat the co-infections, I'll do that. Sometimes I also will start them in the beginning depending on um, what kind of hold a co-infection has. Bartonella is um, the most common infection in the world according to James, Dr. James Shaler and um, it uh, is difficult to treat and can be uh, quite overwhelming. So that is something that um, we could have to consider in the beginning, if it is. And then, so I'm calling this recovery, but I'm not saying that we even know if Lyme is completely curable once it's in the neurological stage, like with my twitching. Um, there are herbs um, that will cross that blood-brain barrier and kill it in the brain. Um, antibiotics don't do that. But, um, you know, it, it's we have no test to even know if we have it in the first place. So we have no test to know if it's even gone. Um, I do believe that we will be able to get rid of this. I'm not sure if we know yet how to do that, but we definitely know how to get the person feeling better, get them in remission, get this non-active and, um, you know, setting somebody up for the rest of their lives so that they have no symptoms. And I have, um, you know, hundreds of clients that are doing just fine after finishing the protocol. Um, after we're done the initial protocol and 
you know, I say that the treatment is, you know, 15 months, two years, but that depends on the person. Some people have gone longer because they're not better yet, or, you know, they just want to make sure whatever is going on. And um, after that, we do some recovery um, just to help, you know, because the body's been ravaged. I mean, every organ is touched by this disease. So um, we need to, with Ch I usually use Chinese herbs for this to put things back in balance and try to um, get things working again, you know, if your spleen was damaged by the Bartonella, we want to get that functioning again so that, you know, you feel better, basically. And so just remember, at the height of my um, my illness, I had over 120 symptoms, this long, long list. This is what I have now. I have three. They're mild. They used to be a 10 out of 10. They're now maybe one or three out of 10. I have some joint pain and muscle tension because I've lost scar tissue from the infection and inflammation. Um, some digestive problems and mild swollen glands. That's it. So I went from, I worked part time because I wouldn't not work. And I and then the rest of the time I sat on the couch and drooled. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm not kidding about that, to be honest. I did not cook. I did not clean. I actually couldn't go into stores because I was so sensitive to the, the off-gassing. Uh, so I lasted five minutes in a store where I could walk for an hour outside. Um, and uh, I, you know, I did not socialize and participate in anything. I now work full time and I run a successful business. I have a very demanding job. I run errands for my house and business. I cook, I clean, I socialize, I shop, I exercise five, six days a week and I have no problem doing any of this. And you know, this for the normal lay person hearing that, oh yeah, whatever, these are things I will never take for granted again. Because there was a point where getting off the couch to get a glass of water was a challenge. So, you know, going from that to be able to, you know, do a hardcore workout and doing yoga for an hour and a half and, you know, doing all these things is it's it's a huge difference in going from this to <laughs> being normal. So it's definitely it's not the hardest thing I've ever done, but it's definitely worth the the journey to get to the end point. Um, and then there is hope for the future. I think number one is um, everybody should join the Lyme Disease Association of Alberta. The more um, numbers they have behind them, the more voices they have, the more they'll be able to speak for us. So, um, you know, it's important. So, you know, sign up your family members. I think it's only an extra dollar after your five dollars to sign up your whole family. And uh, it, it just helps them with those numbers. So, um, number one, we need to get Lyme disease recognized. So there's also the, the bill um, by Elizabeth May, because once we can get that recognized and we have that law behind us, then all of us will, you know, in a couple of years, we'll have a story where we'll all be saying, I was diagnosed by my doctor in Canada, not I spent $20,000 and sold my house just so that I could, you know, get a diagnosis and not even a treatment. So this is quite important, even if you can't do anything else because you're, you're ill, these things will help. Um, and get involved if you're able to, um, and support groups. I think, do we have a support group? Yeah, so, okay. the, the Lyme Disease Association is trying to put together a support group, which we don't have here in Alberta. Um, and, you know, this journey is hard. And even if your partner is supportive, it's nice to talk to other people so that they can go, yes, I have that too, <laughs> you know, sometimes that's just helpful to hear. Um, we also just started a forum on the website um, for my clinic, and um, uh, anybody's welcome to join. Um, we do have a screening process because we're trying to stop spam, we're trying to protect everybody, but, um, you know, if you're not able to leave your house, it's a good place to go just to ask <coughs> questions and talk to people. It's fairly new, but the more people we can get in there, the more we'll be able to help other people. I may have, that's it. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs>